the Church of Christ was the fastest growing church some years gone by. And now it is on the decline. It is among the, the, the slowest. What would have changed and what is different is the question that we have to ask ourselves. Well, we might be able to say um, that it might have been because we have fewer people interested in the gospel. We have the saying that you preach one gospel, you convert 3,000. Today you preach 3,000 sermons and you convert one person. We've heard that. Um, who knows? That may be it. But let, let's see if we can discuss it and see. One of the things that we've got to look at also is the whole aspect of the spreading of the gospel. We have more people populating the earth than we had in years gone by. More people are on the earth. And in fact, some countries are overpopulated, even though in some cases we do say that there's a decline in the birth rate, et cetera. So let's see if we could discuss it. I want to bring some points that I would like you to consider while we're talking about it so that you can um, share your views at the right time. Okay. So I was looking at the Christian Chronicle. The Christian Chronicle is that newspaper or that is written by Christians of the Churches of Christ and given us an update as to Churches of Christ in Trinidad and Tobago and even farther field, particularly the United States. So the United States is really the, the benchmark for much of the surveys and the discussions that are coming out. And what they said is that 102,000 persons are fewer now in the pews of churches as of 2003. We have less now by 102,000 compared to when they did their last survey. Um, and that is the national survey by the 21st century Christian in Nashville that, they, that was published. Now, this is their, their information that they bring in. In 2015, so that year that I just gave you, 2003, but in 2015, <clears throat> in that edition, we were down by not 102,000, but we were down by 165,000 fewer members of fewer souls in the pews in the churches. So by 2003, we're down by 102. We are down by 165,000 more in 2015. And they said that the last quarter century, the total membership has fallen really by one million one hundred and three thousand six hundred and thirteen so let's say over a million people we've lost between 2015 i'm assuming that some of those people would have deceased i'm assuming that even if some people migrate and so on i don't think that it would just move the figures from one place to the next um and most people migrate within the united states that that you have but it is done by over a million people, according to the edition of the Churches of Christ in the United States, Nashville again, 21st century Christian. So they are also saying that in 1990, it was also done by 100,000 people or 7.8%, right? And a total membership of 1,284,000 declined in 1990. Right, and that is a March front page of the National Urban Ministry Conference. That's what they, um, what they said, exist currently. So, meanwhile, the total number of U.S. congregations has slipped also in the United States by twelve thousand three hundred. So, not only did they have in the United States a decline in membership you have in the United States a decline in congregations. And whereas in the Caribbean, I'm not too sure that the decline in congregation is that stark as it is in the United States. In, 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 the, in the Caribbean, I think that we do have some, and I don't have the survey for that, but I do think that there is an increase in some cases in congregations, um, and we could, has had a guess as to why we have the increases, but we do have increases, albeit that some of those congregations start with about four or five people 
and uh, run sometimes 10, 12 people um, that makes it a congregation, but really does not necessarily carry the numbers. So while in the United States, the congregations are down by 12,300 from their 13,174 in 1990. So that means that uh, there's a net loss of congregations of 874 churches in the last quarter, an average of 35 per year. Now, I know all of these figures, it's hard to assimilate all of these figures, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be able to understand that the general genesis is that there is a decline. And if you go back to the Christian Chronicles, it is all written there. If you just Google Christian Chronicles and then you, you Google church decline, you'll get all of these statistics. This is not something that is being made up. This is not something that is being pulled out of a hat. These are the facts that are coming, that are coming forth, right? So there is a decline. There is also an impact for that decline because you can't just take the decline just so because whatever it is, that decline means something and means something very, very seriously. All right? So let me say hello to all of those who join in us on Facebook. Thank you very much for coming on board. We appreciate having you. Um, and we hope that you are able to more or less share your ideas and your thoughts as we're going along. So we're talking about the decline of the churches over the years and the decline in the United States of congregations, of its 874 congregations. But as I said, probably in the Caribbean, we might have an increase because there are reasons that congregations are about the places. In some, in some islands, I hear that there are 100 and something congregations. I've heard in one island that there's 150 congregations. Um, in my Trinidad and Tobago, we have about 48 tops, uh, 48, 49 congregations, it might be, that we have in, in our population of Trinidad and Tobago of 1 million people, 1 point something million people. So for the same period that we were talking about in 1990, 25-year period, that, that is the 25-year uh, period, I think it will be gave you from 2003 coming up. 25-year period, the nation's total population rose in the United States an estimated 320 million people. So it's not a lack of people, not, a, not the handsomes of people at all. So they have grown from 250 million in 1990 to 320 million people. Yeah, that's an increase of 70 million people or 28% increase in people. If there is an increase in the number of people, shouldn't there be an increase in the numbers of the persons going and attending, being baptized, etc.? One would think so, but it may not necessarily follow. Certainly, we've seen that it is not following that trend at all. Now, if there's anything that you want to stop me along the way to be able to share, please do so. Um, you can probably raise your hand, not all the time I would see all the hands, but you can unmute your microphone and say that you want to, to share something. I want to come to a point when I'm going to also ask questions to ask you to say, what might attribute to this decline that we are seeing? And this is not, um, this is not endemic, you know. this is almost pandemic that you have a global decline that's taking place, okay? All right, and if you want those on Facebook, you just post your question or your comments on the, on the Facebook, and those of you who wish to do so, you could do so on the chat. All right, so, so there are many factors, I'm sure, that is causing this situation to take place with the Churches of Christ, However, a number of denominations are expanding exponentially. They are multiplying, they are getting large, and they are, are growing in numbers. What might cause that? Um, 
one particular statistics that is of interest according to the chronicle is that the settling unsettling growth in the number of religiously unaffiliated people these are people who are religious but not affiliated to any particular church so now people just call themselves a christian but i don't go to church so in during the 1980s a number of studies reported the consistency of uh, between 5% to 8% of individuals claiming to have no religious affiliation. And uh, that is really true because when you speak to a number of people, no, I don't go to any church. Do you believe in God? Yes. Which is different from an atheist. An atheist doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in religion, don't go to church. But now we have a number of people who are stark, claim to be stark believers but want to have nothing to do with church and religion. Hmm. Ain't that something? And then there are further study that revealed that in 2012, the number had more than doubled. So you are increasing the number of religious people globally, while at the same time reducing the number of churchgoers as in the case of the Church of Christ, actually reducing the number of members in it. But now we're talking about globally, outside of the church. We're just talking about it from the standpoint. More people are religious today, but fewer people are churchgoers today. I wonder if we have discouraged people from church because of the way churches, and I'm not talking about Church of Christ here, churches have manifested themselves. So now we are at um, we are at a point that we are reaping the whirlwind of how we have operated in churches, general churches here now, not church of Christ, churches, the imagery and the perception of church. Because even if the church is teaching the truth, teaching the doctrine, as long as those people out there point themselves and say the churches these are these are the things that are going on in churches everybody gets painted with the same brush yes and they said that number of doubled of the people who are religious but non church goers 20% of the us population it is now at 20% they said 14% or which is almost 33 million religiously unaffiliated americans are uh, neither agnostic nor atheist. That's what I was just telling you. The, the atheist says there is no God. And if I'm not mistaken, the agnostics say they're not sure if there is a God. So they are not even including the agnostics and the atheists. They are talking about people who actually believe that there is a God, who are unaffiliated religiously. Hmm. And now we, when we're talking about social media and Zoom, it gives people a platform to be religious and don't congregate as a church. And that I suspect is growing largely. In fact, now people not associating themselves with a church when it comes to social media. They just attend any church that, te that preaches Bible or, or claim to preach Bible. They just go to any one of them. Even members of the Church of Christ now do church hopping, virtual church hopping. And I'm not saying that is something wrong to be able to, to listen to churches and preachers, etc., from various places, because they do give quite a bit of information, valuable information, and you, you, you do learn from them. But it's now where they are not even associating with it. And that is troubling. That certainly is trouble. Right? So two thirds of people believe in God. One out of every five claim to pray every day. Very religious. They consider themselves to be religious or spiritual but they rarely, if ever, attend a worship service. They have no church life, have no church family. I know that since COVID, a number of churches and congregations said that they have not seen members of their congregations ever since churches opened back to full service. So we've even lost 
people who we had pre-COVID. All right? How are, how are you all doing? Are you all following me? I want to make sure that you all are with me. I don't want you all to fall off the fall off the wagon. Sister Moesina said, I think that many people don't want to change to comply with the word, but want to be free of the constraints of accountability to others or a church. Yeah, uh, I think people don't want to align. There's an apathy, Sister Moesina, and, and your, my good people. There's an apathy when it comes to church. I think that religion has, um, religion has, left a bad taste in the mouth of people who want God. But what they see taking place in churches, and I'm using churches here in its wider sense again, um, what they see taking place in churches, they don't like. Churches have become very um, capitalist. It has become a money. So churches are perceived by some as being hypocritical, preaching one thing, and in the very church, something else is going on. Many preachers have been charged for abuse of, of their own spouse. And these are people who have been preaching well, good speakers. Um, so you have a number of people who say, no, this can't be that you operate so holy and so righteous and you're doing such reprehensible work. And and job. I'm going to come to you just now, Sister Musina. Sister Sandra said, um, oh yeah, she's confirming Sister Musina, they want to worship according to them and not according to God. Yeah. And that is what we end up with. You know, we have the boutique, church boutique, I call it, where you could just walk into a boutique and just choose the style you want. And if you don't like the style in that boutique, you just go into the next boutique. That's what we have come to where if you, if, you, if you associate or you link on to a church you don't like the singing i will just go to a church that i like the singing um you don't like the preaching you, you just go to a church where you like the preaching it has nothing to do with the soundness of doctrine the truth of god's word but it has to do where i feel that i fit in nicely yes i like this church people say i feel comfortable in this church but it's not about comfort and like. It is nice when you're comfortable and you are liking it. But it has got to be. The purpose must be because it is sound true. It's just like selecting a partner or spouse. You might like somebody because they look good. Handsome guy, wonderful, sweet, beautiful woman. That's good. And it's nice if you have that. But should you make your decision based on those criteria? Or should you make your decision based on the fact that the person has good character? Because the character is what holds the relationship together, not the good looks. Because people get into relationship with good looks and leave because they, the person does not have good character. But the person is still looking good. So when we get into a church because we like the church and we like how it operates, um, what has to hold you is the soundness of the doctrine. All right, let me go to Sister Mosina. Um, I think too that you have to account also for the fame of the churches that, you know, the general churches um, in Christendom, as it were, because many people see those churches, the, fam the famous churches and the famous ministers, the ones on TV, and they think that is church, they're not knowing that that is not actually church. You know, and because that's what they view church as and see it as that what's going on there is brushed over everybody. So mm. it being brushed over everybody now and everybody has some knowledge of what the word of God is, right? They may not have the full Bible and verse, but they have knowledge of it, you know, to know that some things are not right. So with that broad brush stroke of, of everybody being considered the same church, you know, then we, with uh, with those who are in the, the limelight, you know, and in the fame and the spotlight, you know, then they, we, we are casted in, in, a, in a bad light, right? Even though that is not who we are as a church of Christ, 
you know, but we are not in the limelight. So there's a lot of that and there's a lot of also religiosity, as you said, I agree with you totally, you know, to appear spiritual and to people, granted, you're not really actually following anything. You know, you're just giving a word online to appear, but you're not actually living that life. Um, I accept that and I see Sister Sandra is also saying something along the same line that you are saying, where she says that a lot of persons think as long as they pray to God, um, cool, that's it. They, she said she heard of prostitutes and criminals say they pray before going out on the streets for God's protection. Yeah. Somebody, an entertainer, will sing a song full of expletives, talking about violence and, and gun shooting and so on. And they may win an award or, or something for the, for the song. And they say they thank God for the talent to mess up our children's mind because the inside of the song is talking about smoking and, uh, and drugs and so on. Prostitution. And they thank God for the talent to do so well. So we really, we really, you know, because we had in days gone by some people who were dedicated, committed um, to their belief that you saw it in the, their manifestation. And I would say this, eh, um, this morning, I, I, I got a call that there's an 80-year-old woman in South Trinidad who um, is not well. I said, my goodness, let me just, be, and I'm hustling off to go to worship. But I said, let me just call the lady before I leave to go to worship and um, and get, express her with my, my, my thoughts uh, with her, et cetera, for her illness, 80 years old. So I called her and I, I wanted to pray with her, et cetera. Yeah, 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 elderly lady. The lady is dressed and waiting for somebody to pick up to go to church. I called to tell her, I hope that she feels better. She's not feeling well. But as far as she's concerned, she is going to worship. And what the family tells me is that one of the things they always see is her, she does be sick sometime whole week. And when it comes to church, regardless of what, she's going. We don't have that kind of stamina, that kind of commitment again. In many quarters, not, and I'm not saying for everybody, but you just get the sniffles, you just feel tired, and bam, somebody decides to stay home. People fought for the freedom to worship God freely. They gave their life for it because at one point you were killed for having to even say that you're worshiping God publicly. And they fought for it. We have it. And now we, we don't utilize the goodness of it. So that lady cheered up my heart so much. 80 years old, dressed and ready. She said, I, I prefer to dress and wait for them to pick me up than for them to come to pick me up and, and wait on me. Boy, she, she's such a sweet lady. Yeah, South Trinidad. Um, I don't know, if, some of you may, may know her sister Charles. I, I'll give her name because I, I think she, she, she's worth of, of mentioning. That's what we're talking about, the kind of regularity, because that's where growth comes from, because they're coming out and hear the word of God, the teachings, etc., and so on. Good evening. Some like church because of the music and dancing, says Janet Ragu. Yes. And that's why many churches have gone towards entertainment and concert style in order to lure people into their churches. So they want them to enjoy the worship. So you go to church and you enjoy the worship, but you go home empty spiritually. But because you go home with this enjoyment, you think you're really full. But you are no closer, in some cases, you are no closer to God Almighty. So the Bible says these people draw near unto me with their lips. Right? Honor me with their lips, but the heart is far from me. That, that is a wonderful commitment on the part of me. Yes, 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 yes. She, well, I tell her, she, she, she bites my heart. The, the family say that she always does that. Regardless of how sick she is, 
she, they say she'll get better, go to church, and then come home and she's sick again. <laughs> wow. All right. Any other comment? Sister Stuart says on Facebook, some are too sick on Sunday for worship and Monday morning they are okay for work. Absolutely. Mammon, your employer, our government get more out of us than God does in many cases. No wonder if we are to decline. You see, because we are going to make, we will be sick on a Sunday go to work on a Monday because of the reward the government will give us or employer will give us for coming out still. But we have not matched up the reward we get of eternal life. After that employer goes out of business, the government is over because the world has ended. The reward that you get is what is supposed to cause us to hold the faith, hold the faith. Um, Sandra said that's because they think the worship is all about them. Um, I'm not too sure what is that referring to. I don't know if it is when we said that it has become a concert and a place of enjoyment. Um, probably that is my, what she might be referring to. Right. So I, I hope that if you all missed it, because I shared the statistics about the decline that is taking place in the United States. And we are saying that in the United States, there's also a decline in congregations and in, in membership. I suspect that we do have, we don't have a decline in congregations. We might even have increase in congregations. And here's why in some cases, there may be an increase in congregation. In some cases, not all. When there is disaffection and there is a, Leadership split. Sometimes leaders start their own group. So technically, you have a split in the congregation and a new congregation starts. So it increases the number of congregations, but it does not necessarily increase in the members. Sometimes they, they siphon members from the congregation they came from and start this new congregation. So it's the same numbers or sometimes less because some people got fed up of the split and leave the church completely. So it is a decline, the paradox of progress, a decline that is taking place when you think there's progress taking place. Right? But we could always talk about that uh, further in, in probably as we go along with, with some other sessions that we're doing. So... Why is this important for us to know what's going on? And it will be good to have a research that tracks what's happening in the Caribbean. Because this information that we would collect would tell us to what degree, that what rate are we declining at? And what are some of the issues that we'll see? Because if we look at what's happening in the United States, congregations have declined so much that their building is much larger than necessary given their current prevailing numbers. So you are in a, a building that is so large that your voice begins to echo because the numbers in it are so small. And additionally, I've known of congregations and even the Chronicles have written about the congregations that their numbers have declined so much that they can no longer continue to pay for the upkeep of the very building that they are in, lights, water, taxes, or, um, whatever it is, statutory cost, et cetera. And now some have had to rent out part of the churches. One church rent out its, its congregation, the hall, to a nearby funeral home so that when people have Funerals, they rent the place there so that they could do, go and do the church part of it and bury their dead because they cannot pay their own way. Mm -hmm. I've understood one church rented to a denomination so that the denomination will use it on some of the days because that's the only way they could keep the building. So, you provide a facility for a doctrine you don't support in order to keep the doctrine being preached where you are. Hmm. 
That's why we need to trap what is going on. We need to, to mark what is going on. This is not as simple as you think. Also, the congregations are aging. The leadership is aging. But there's little or no passing of the baton to a younger generation. So after a group of people have become aged and they've held the pulpit for quite a while, by the time you are ready now to exit the pulpit, there's nobody there to take it over. One preacher said that he has preached the gospel so long there. In fact, he's preaching while he is in a wheelchair now in the United States. And he said he has preached the gospel so long and has, has buried many of its members because everybody has aged around the, all of them come around the same age that he said he has preached the church into the ground, literally preached the church into the ground, using a play of words. And when you say you're converted by a generation, that generation all tend to die off around the same time, between five, 10 years of each other, people just start dying. And have you ever noticed that when there is there's the death of somebody in the church, their friend, their relative, the, the people, their contemporaries also die not too long after because they're around the same age. And what happens when that happens? You're going to have a decline in membership. So I hope people are listening. So that is why it is important to track what's going on. If attendance therefore declines, then fewer people hear the word of God Fewer children learn about Jesus. Fewer hearts are picked to go forth and teach the gospel. Um, and fewer families get, um, get to become, as a family, members of the Lord's church. Teens, which is our greatest asset in preparing us for the next millennium or the next generation. They don't have the truth because they are not around to hear the truth and be taught the truth. Numbers, therefore, matter. So, 1 Timothy 2 4 says that God desires all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of truth. All right, let me see if there's any more hands that are up that want to share anything. Um, let me go to the chat. Internet, the roar of the internet, okay. And TV fame churches overwhelm the public perception too much, decipher the unadulterated truth and simplicity of Christianity. Well, um, let me tell you, the, many of these churches that come up, they don't even claim to be churches in them. They are technically business enterprises owned by a, a, a family. And when that family ready to demit, they hand it over to their child because it's a business. So when you hear things of, and let's take, for example, is T.D. Jake's ministry a church or is it a business? Because if it is a church, why is it carrying his name and not Christ's name? And T.D. Jakes has recently handed over his church, if you want to call it that, to his daughter. Why? Because it's their business. When Christ said, upon this rock, I will build my church, where was T.D. Jakes at that time? So when you're going to join a church, you ask yourself those things. Joel Olstein's ministry, Joyce Meyer's ministry. Who can vote them out? Who can put them out? Who can remove them when they own it? And that's why they tend to pass it down to their own families. Keep it in the dynasty. Okay. That's why we need to preach gospel. When Christ says, I will build my church, 
That is why the Church of Christ is not the name of the church. The Church of Christ is demonstrating ownership. Yeah? That is Michael's shoes. Ownership. Church of Christ. Ownership. Everyone wants to know what can be done to better church membership and participation. Good question. We're not too sure we'll have all that time to be able to answer it, but we'll try. Um, so, and I'll come to that, Aaron, and if I don't come to it, just remind me to do it, because I think I would want to touch on it, even if I can't deal with it. Acts 2.41, here's what the Bible says. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day they were added 3,000 souls in one crusade. One crusade. 3,000 souls. One day. You know, we spend so much money on crusades. Rent place, rent tents, do flyers, provide chairs, PA system, etc. We spend thousands of dollars. And I know that there were in the days when, and that is, I'm talking about 50 something years ago, because I'm a Christian now, 50 years. So in those days, when you had a baptism in the church, it was real people baptizing, because people took the gospel nightly in those crusades. Now you have a whole week of crusade, and nobody is converted or baptized in the end of it, in some cases. Some cases, yes, you have one or two. But this one here, 3,000. So we're not knocking the one or two because we are not the one to give the increase. God is the one to give the increase. Here's what we're saying. We are asking and inquiring what changed. What caused the change from 3,000 in one day? And that is what Aaron is also asking. What can we do to better church membership and participation? Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. The Bible says, so the word of God continued to spread. Yeah. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew rapidly. And great number of priests became obedient to the faith. That is how it was. That is how it was. It grew. So, I think I want to take, take, take you to, to some scriptures here now. Let, let, let's take in some scriptures here now. So, answer my boy, Aaron Austin. There was a nice mix in the former days of planters, waterers, in the missionary work, evangelism, etc. A nice mix of planters and waterers. And I consider planting as people going to plant congregations, going out there to plant the word of God into the hearts of people. And I consider the preaching to be watering, teaching in Bible classes, and, and what we're doing here is watering, continuing to nurture and grow. I suspect that what we do is go out and we teach. And then we put everybody, in some cases, into the entire Bible study. So we are teaching something there, new convert, but they are not continuing to be taught things that would now orient them into the doctrine and the teachings of it. They more or less come from milk, and we drop them into meat in some cases. So that does not work well. And then we have more emphasis in many congregations upon the preaching and not the teaching in, in some cases, you don't have a chance to ask questions. You don't have a chance to interact, etc. cetera. Um, First Corinthians chapter three, verse four to six, the Bible says, and when one says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, are you not mere humans? What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through 
whom you came to believe. They were only servants. As the Lord has assigned to each his task. So this thing is our work. We have a task to do it. He said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God has been making it grow. And that nice mix of watering, planting and watering is what I think we miss. If you ask the, any congregation, how many of the members are actually going out to teach and preach the gospel to the lost? Most of it is upon a preacher or one or two members in the church. Before, everybody was going out. In years gone by in the churches, a large number of the members of the church were personally teaching people in their jobs, in their families, in their neighborhood. They were actually teaching and they were competent to teach it because they knew the scriptures. Not today. Not today. So we have waterers, no planters. You know what that tells me? It reminds me of when hotel, the hoteliers here say they want to order lettuce and order pak choy and order tomatoes from local growers. But here's what happened. The growers plant and supply the hotels well on the first tranche. But many of our local farmers don't go back to plant, constantly plant. So they already gave the hotel that. <clears throat> By the time the hotel asks for another set, your set not ready yet because you planted late or you did not plant at all. So they stop by from the local people. And I think that is what happens that we, we plant and we've had our foreign crusades and so on and we planted. But I suspect that we did not continue to plant. So you don't have the continued growth in the church. And many people do not, are not competent in teaching it. Right. Yep. Oh, you went? Okay. Yes, you could see the difference. Things change. Now, things will change, but they don't have to change for the worse. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 78. The Bible says, so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. Now, we think that that is something to us. I baptize this person. I baptize it. Paul said, I, I didn't even baptize one. Yeah? Yeah? So it is who church and whose congregation doing well so we compete sometimes with congregation. He says, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. I don't know what that one purpose is. To increase the harvest. Because God is the one to give the increase. So we are increasing the availability of the harvest by teaching the word. And each man will be rewarded according to their labor. Now, ain't that something? Look at that. If the Bible says each person will be rewarded according to their labors, and our labor, God's labor is increased. Our labor, he said, is planting and watering, and we are going to be rewarded according to our labors. What's your reward? If you ask yourself, are you planting and if your reward is going to be according to your labor, how much labor are you putting into to planting, teaching people, spreading the gospel? You don't think that some of us will be going home without a salary if that was a job to be paid? What about the watering? Calling on members and checking up on people and sharing, encouraging them so much the more as you see the day approaching. How many of us take personal accountability for a younger person in the faith, in the word? Yeah? And if you are supposed to be paid, paid according to your labor, what is your reward going to look like? 
So, Aaron, I want you to I want to use that as my first answer as to what we could do to better church membership and participation. Get more people taught. Get more people understanding how to teach the gospel. More Christians, that is, knowing how and feeling confident that I know how to teach the gospel. As long as you have members who are coming there and enjoying nice sermons and they're not being able to translate that because the Bible says that we ought to teach people who can be able to teach others also. You are training people to teach others. And once you do not have that, church growth is always going to be sacrificed on the altar of incompetence because we cannot teach the gospel. Yeah. So it is to now train members more. But you, they've got to come out. <laughs> you can't train them if they're not coming out. They have got to come out to be exposed to the world. All right. I want to go to Acts chapter 6 now. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 says this. Now in those days, now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying. Ooh, if we could just get those days back. There was a complaint. Oh, you have complaint and church multiplying? We think that whenever persecution and hard times come, that the church naturally should decline. Not so in Acts. It is when they were persecuted, the church spread. Because as they scattered, they went with the gospel. So while the church was multiplying, there arose a complaint. No problem with complaints in it. We just split church off a complaint. They used to multiply the church off a complaint. They complained against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. They weren't happy about that. Then the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples. And I want to show you leadership. A complaint arose from the general membership. Leadership got together. You hear what he said? The 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples. The leadership immediately took action with those complaints that the members were making. Today, sometimes when members complain, we shun those members. We ostracize them. We put them out because we don't like nobody oppose us. Oh, you're going to oppose wise me? You're going to oppose a bright person like myself and, and challenge me? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to put you out of my church. I'm going to ostracize. I'm going to, I, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. But they, they understood it a different way. A complaint arose. They called everybody together. And here's what the Bible says. It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Here's what is clear to me. They understood distribution of labor. You see this thing where three people doing all the work of the church for everybody else in the church to gain? It was never God's design. They understood distribution of labor. We will continue to preach God's word, but there's a need here that has arisen. And this need needs to be addressed because it's a complaint and we cannot ignore the complaint of the members. So let's address it. So he says, it is not desirable that we leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men and listen to it. Not just choosing people we like, not just choosing people who are close to us, not just choosing our family, Seek out seven men of good reputation. Sometimes we have building in the church with some bad reputation and they're holding some key positions in it. Nobody, has, nobody there touched them. Key positions that they're holding. Their family life in shambles. Their personal life in shambles. Their reputation on the job is, is questionable. And we put them there because we want somebody in the position. But no. These people understood imagery and the reflection of the integrity of the church and the value that God places on his own name for the Lord's name. 
in his name's sake. You had to choose people of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit. Not only they have good reputation because they're nice and they have rank and they have position in society, but they also have the Holy Spirit in them. And that must be a lifestyle thing and wisdom. What a thing if you have a church that has a complaint and you have leadership that understand that format. A lot of problems, a lot of the splits in the church will not take place. It is because you got together. And listen, eh? the 12 are the apostles. Eh? But they didn't keep the issue among themselves. Sometimes we have this clique in the church that run things. But the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples. To me, I probably think that they called together a church meeting. Yeah, brethren, this is what is the thing. People have been complaining. The Hellenists have been neglected. This is what they complain about. But they didn't deal with who, who coming and They didn't ask, who is the one complaining? There? Tell me who is it complaining? That wasn't the issue that they came together for, you know. They came together to deal with the complaint and to, to cause a solution to it. We don't be concerned about who said it and why they want to talk about that and why, why they want to embarrass us. Even some people might be listening to this now and they're going to start, um, they might come and say, well, Brother Mike, you see, Brother Mike, go and expose church business on, on Facebook and all of that. And, and people that might very well want to, to deal with it from that standpoint. Because that's how we are. I don't know. But they could call me, my number on, online, um, and we could talk about it. And I'm saying this in love. But we need to be able to address some things that are affecting us. We can't ignore it. You see? And if we could deal with it, let's deal with it. You see? So it is not good. He called everybody together and says, this thing is not desirable, that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, seek out these people with good reputation. Right? Listen to verse 3 to 7. Here's what the Bible says. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men, good reputation, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom when you appoint over these business. Verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Distribution of labor. You cannot give up the spreading of the gospel and the teaching of it for internal church matters. But you must have somebody addressing internal church matters. And verse 5 says, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. You see, and that is why you're not going to have dissension. In because the complaint came, they called together everybody. So everybody's aware of it. And everybody knows the condition that you are looking for. You are looking for people that you could trust to handle this thing. So it must please the whole, the whole multitude. That's leadership. Involvement of people. People should not be saying, I don't know what's going on with the church finance. I don't know what's going on with the church. I only hear that we're having a fellowship next week. You understand? Everybody knows what is taking place. And when they heard it, and when they heard the qualifications, good reputation, Holy Spirit, and all of that, so they now needed to look among them for a person to handle that. I hear what the Bible said. And the same thing, the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen. Stephen. Why? Because Stephen handsome. No. Because Stephen have money. No. Because Stephen popular. No. They chose Stephen. A man full of faith. And the Holy Spirit. And they add on to them, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, Apostolite from Antioch. They had from them people who were qualified. But the reason, I know he have a little family thing and so on, and his wife go talk to him and his wife separate from, from him and so on, but we don't have anybody to, to give it to, so we had to end up asking him. You, you don't have to. You understand? They made a decision, and that is why the reputation of the church. Because when people see that, they are drawn into the Lord's church. What time is it? I want to make sure I'm going to go time. Whom, when they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. 
Then the word of God spread. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> now you see why the word of God spread. After you take a stand like that, you think the word of God, they didn't talk about um, that they hold in a set of crusaders. The word of God naturally spreads. The word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. People of other denominations and all came in. Aye, aye, aye. If you do it right, the word of God is going to multiply. If we're not doing it right, it declines. Part of the decline of the word and the membership that we have is because many things we are not doing right. There are many members who are leaving because they are, don't like what they see. They don't like what's going on. Members are changing congregations. Men are leave, uh, leaving con churches and going into denominations. Some people are leaving the church completely and denominations want to have nothing to do with churches and so on. And some people are sitting there completely mesmerized and dead while in the church because they have lost enthusiasm. I have not said anything here tonight to try to embarrass anybody or try and give anybody a negative um, reaction. But I felt it necessary to be able to speak plainly and bravely in season and out of season. That was my intention only. But if you do have an issue, feel free to call me. Let's sit down and talk. Even if you agree with it and you want to discuss further, let's sit down and talk. And we're going to um look forward to that okay so that brings us to eight o'clock sharp right on the dot